Welcome to Grazing Hell, the one and only podcast made by a cow. And today I've got a very special guest. Woo woo! Kunkin Dance Dance. I <laughs> see. I call you. I call you Duncan because that's your real name. But your YouTube that is name, my real name is actually the letters swapped. I did make it a little tricky to pronounce. I don't know why I did that, but yeah. A bit of a tongue twister. So it's so rather than Duncan. Canster, Canster. Uh, it's Castner, so it's like Kunkin Dastner. I have I so many comments being N. like, I have so many comments being like, "Hey, how do you pronounce your channel name?" Like, <laughs> Good luck. I don't even know. Yeah. Okay. So, Kunkin Dastner. Mm-hmm. Gosh, I'm just gonna call you Duncan throughout this because that's I'm your honestly, given birth yeah. name. I assume that's the name you were given by, you know, the stork that brought you to the door. Exactly. Where babies come mm-hmm. from. In case people didn't know, that's where babies come from. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, welcome. Welcome to the pod. So yeah, do you want to just tell the listeners slash viewers a little bit about yourself, just in case they aren't familiar yeah, with you? Absolutely. Um, I am a social commentary YouTuber. I try to talk about something every week. I have a background in video editing, and I started my channel to basically as work as a resume. Be like, hey, everyone, I can edit. You should hire me. And then uh, around the beginning of this summer, I had around 6,000 followers. And then Tiffany Ferg gave me a shout out on her channel. She Aww. does a small creator channel mm, shout out mm-hmm. thing. So she shouted out my channel and my following went from 6K to 10K. And I was like, <clears throat> wow, that's, that's good. I'm happy with this. But then all of those new viewers watched my current video and then that video took off. And it went from 10K to 60K in What video month. was that? That was my video talking about the fan reaction to the comedian John Mulaney's divorce. I was talking about how fans get so invested in social media relationships. It was not the video I thought would take off, but mm. it did. And I, I'm here now. I'm, I'm at, I believe, 70,000. And I, it's 70,000 more than I ever thought I would have. Yeah. So it's very exciting. Oh, so you're not far from getting your plaque. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, Though, that, that was I my would... one YouTube goal, <laughs> is to get that yeah. plaque. I have no idea what I'm going to do next. Yeah, I mean, that being said, though, I say that you'll get it at 100k. Usually what happens, and this is what's when I've spoken to people, you hit 100k and you don't get the plaque till several months later. <laughs> so right, you'll probably you be to, like, at like 200k. And... Yeah. Exactly, right. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So what made you decide to do social commentary? Obviously, it was like a portfolio for your editing, but why, why that right. genre? What, what drew you to it? Well, I think it's mostly because that was the content I watched for mm. years. I think I would go to YouTube specifically for commentary to hear people's takes on different things. I I mean, for me, that's just how I expand my, like, bubble. That's how I hear new opinions from new people. So for four years, I watched that, and then I was like, I'm going to try this. And especially because during lockdown, I cannot, like, go out and film a short film or, like, a challenge video, or I don't even know. (laughs) It was like, I've got the couch and the internet. This is just what I can do. Mm. And I've I've ended up having a lot of fun with it. I try to not, like, even with people who are annoying and bad, I would say, I try to put this, like, positive spin on it just because most of the commentary videos I see are very, they're, they're intellectual and they have good arguments behind them, but sometimes they just kind of, like, make fun of them. And my... My basically the the theme of my channel is like, hey, people can be dumb and stupid, but you can like critique that without attacking things they can't control. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things I really love about your content because I think you always approach things with empathy, and at least I, I, I try really to. admire yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I actually 
I'll, t- I'll tell you a little story as like a little side tangent, but it is relevant. I think mm-hmm. I have one of those moments where I think with commentary, like because I'm British and very sarcastic, not that that's a, an excuse to like be a dick or whatever, but like, you know what I mean? I, my humor I can come off like to some audiences as a bit dry and a bit like, oh my God, is she being really like patronizing? Does she think she's like the shit? And I'm like, no, I really don't. I'm... But anyway, um, I <laughs> did a video on Jubilee, you know, Jubilee? I've watched your video on that, yes. Yeah, so they contacted me like that night and they they took the criticism beautifully. Like they 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 were really classy about it. They were really lovely about it. It was a guy called John um, and he wow. the, the subject of the email was what a terrible, but like pronounced the American way, terrible video. And he was like, sorry, I'm going to be a dad soon. Like he was so lovely about it. And I think it was that moment that I was like, oh, that was kind of like a a click, something kind of clicked for me. And I was like, you know what? I think from now on, A, I don't want to go after individuals, unless they're truly terrible. If they're like- Well, massive, right, yeah. yeah. But, but in general, and B, I'm going to try and just be more empathetic and more thoughtful in my commentary. And I think that's what happens when you grow as well. Like when you're smaller, you're just- what you say feels really inconsequential but then as you grow you realize you've got to be much more careful because you're basically setting an example you know yeah i i kind of learned that at a very early time in my channel because the first two commentary videos i made both got responses from the people i was talking about Uh... so immediately i was like people watch these like oh the first one was are you familiar with perez hilton He's yes, the I am. paparazzi guy the, who talks about like the media and he's kind of like a low, like, I don't know, I don't want to talk too much trash on him, but he he's kind of like a content vulture. Yes. And his whole deal is that if you make a video on him, he will find it. But he's so like, famous. If, he is, but he searches his name. So like any tweet that has his name in it, he will like it. Like he... Like, I didn't know this at the time, but I made my video because he was duetting, like, a young TikTok star being, like, kind of creepy. So I my video was like, hey, don't be weird to minors on TikTok. <laughs> and then he commented on the video just being like, great video. I loved your delivery. Like, and I was like, "Are is that real? Is that Perez I- Hilton? And then my second video was on another TikTok star who commented under the video. And I'm just like, this stuff is real. Like, (laughs) this is a very public forum. So immediately I knew that, like, I need to make my videos as if the people watching, or as if the people of the video will watch it. So I try my best to, to speak to the camera as if they are there. That's a really, I think that's a really good approach because it's, you know, exactly. I think it's really easy to forget that creators are people from a creative Mm -hmm. perspective, but also from a uh, audience perspective. And I do think I've come to appreciate that more being a creator. um, Right. Just because you're on the other side and you're like, oh God, I'm really flawed. Please please don't expect much from me. I'm incredibly flawed. You know, I... I don't know. It's just, it's, it's tricky. And actually this reminds me, someone, when I posted that you were going to be on here, someone mm-hmm. wanted me to ask you, cause you're a quarantine baby YouTuber. Um, same here actually. Um, yeah. how, how is it growing really quickly? Is it a lot of pressure? Like how have you dealt with like manage that? Well, it's, it's, I love talking about this because <laughs> it's so interesting to me that moment when Tiffany Ferg shouted out my channel, that was the week I was moving from my university back home. So I was stressed out about like, what what am I going to do with this couch? Or like, how many boxes Hmm. can I afford to ship home? And I had all these like real world like stressors happening. And then every time I would log on, I would see I went up another 10k. and I'd be like, that's really cool. But also, I got to figure out how to move this thing. So it didn't feel real to me until I was back here, all moved in. I could, like, breathe. And I'm like, oh, does that really say 60K? Is that real? And then I had to be like, oh, 
like all of a sudden my videos are not just getting 2000 views anymore but like there is an audience there and i kind of wouldn't have it any other way because i think having that kind of like balance where you're not too heavily on like oh i'm famous now and like letting it go straight to your head and then also <laughs> not like I can't think about the internet right now. I have to move these boxes, but like some kind of like healthy medium, I think, mm. I think that was probably the best way for my brain to digest that happening. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cause I think as obviously as joyous as it is, you get this adrenaline rush. Cause it, this is what we've all, we all wait for, right? We post because we want people to watch the videos. We don't just post for the sake of it. Right. So it's exactly. like a great moment and it's a payoff. And that kind of thing. But I do think every creator goes through this phase where they're just like, I, I don't know about you, but I found like I wanted it to slow down. I was like, I need to, I need a moment to just digest this because I'm not ready yes. for more yet. Like yeah. I'm still getting used to this. Uh, yeah. Mm. Like, did your channel know. grow in like a similar like fashion? Did you have yes. one big boost? I think it was it was very extreme um everyone i talked to about this was like whoa that's really weird what basically what happened was my video essay on the pick me girl meme kind of it hit off and i hit like 10k in a day and that was like after a month i posted it wow and then within a week i was on 100k it was it was i don't know oh. what the hell happened and then like only about a month later, I was on 200. So it's fortunately, I say fortunately, like obviously I want growth and that's great. So now it's like at a normal rate and I'm kind right. of relieved because I, I'm still getting used to being like, I, I don't know, it, it's subjective, but I think people would consider 200K like a mid creator in yeah. I'm happy at this point and I think I'm not ready to be bigger yet. So I just want it to... I completely understand that. Yeah. yeah, it's just a lot. And like, especially when you're covering political stuff, like I, I, so for example, the video that took off, like it was very imperfect. I didn't fact check everything thoroughly. Like, it's I always didn't know the videos to... you don't want to get yeah, famous that exactly. end up like, I look, like, yeah. yeah, I look back at it and I'm like, oh, I do this so differently, you know, but it I guess forced me to learn that you know you as you say you just got to imagine that a the people you're talking about are watching it and b you know people are kind of taking what you say to heart and therefore you got to make yes. sure that it's absolutely accurate you know um oh absolutely yeah so yeah it's it's yeah like um who was it I think I was talking to Jordan recently you know Jordan Teresa and she was saying mm -hmm. that she her goal is to hit 500k and then once she hits that she's happy and actually won't want to get that, more yeah. than that <laughs> yeah because i think once you hit and tiffany made a video about this like how once you hit a million you kind of don't feel as connected with your audience um right, and i imagine yeah. that being the case just because i'm sure you have this like when you're smaller you recognize like the icons and the usernames and stuff and that's a bit harder mm -hmm. to do when um you grow I mean, there's still like, yeah. I still see the same ones, but it's just like harder, I think. Yeah, that's true. You kind of have to like scroll down and like go through like a lot of the general responses. And then you'll see someone like, you were following me when I had 500 subscribers. And it's just yeah. kind of like, it's like you have to look for them. But like when you find them, it's, it's touching. It really is. It's just, I, they really are like the bread and butter of your work. And it's just really exactly. cool to see them stick around. Um, but yeah, so what would you say is one of your hardest videos you've made? Because you make like social commentary. Right. Um, it's a hard mm. question, I know. I think I, I try to make my videos as discussion based as possible. Mm. I try to like bring up a topic, like say my opinions on it, but like nothing too definitive. Because there's there's nothing more annoying than like someone making a YouTube video and being like, these are my opinions and those are facts. And then <laughs> you're just kind of like, oh, no, they're not. So I try to make my videos as like opinion based as possible. Looking at my channel now, the hardest video I've ever had to make. Are you familiar with Gabby Hanna? Yes, I am. 
And I think that's a I, really complicated topic. I think covering her was the hardest video I've had to make in the sense that there's just a mountain of YouTube videos, commentary videos about Gabby Hanna that I agree with in the sense that they are bringing up important things, but the execution that they do it in is just, I don't know. I'm not trying to say my video is like the best one, but like a lot of these videos use the, her face in the, in the thumbnail where it's like very like hyper realized and like the, it's got shaders and filters on her face. They don't make make her her look flattering. And I get that that's like a thumbnail thing and you have to get people to click the video. But even even in my thumbnail, right, I didn't choose like the most flattering picture of her like in a red carpet dress and full makeup. Mm. But I didn't want to like be, hey, everyone, look at this crazy woman. Because like, I don't mm. think that's the problem. I think the problem that she exhibits is more of a attention-based cycle that we just see in a constant repeat at the expense of like anyone who interacts with her. Yeah. And I, I wanted to be so careful with that video. And unfortunately, I say unfortunately, but like that's one of the videos that also kind of took off. So mm-hmm. like a lot of people were watching it and the whole time I was just like nervously being like, did I do a good job? Like, is everyone mm. okay with this? And Thankfully, right, like the reception was very kind and positive and I'm very good. thankful for the, the good comments. But I was just so nervous the whole time I was making that, you know, I wanted I wanted to take on that subject with, I don't know, grace. Yeah, well, that's that's something I wanted to ask, actually, because like because you approach things in such an empathetic way, I think that's like a strength. But do you ever find people come at you and say, oh, you were too nice on this person? because yes. I had that once when I made a comment about Gabby Hanna on someone else's video I was just like listen not condoning anything she's done but like she's you a human can. being yeah. and I think her being a laughing stock isn't helping anyone like it's not helping her the victims of like the stuff she's done like right. just making her into like a clown a circus clown isn't like good for public discourse and people were Completely. someone was like oh here's a grave I dug for you like go take a dirt nap and, all oh, this shit. and I was like Listen, I'm not, like, I have no stick in this game. Like, I'm not, I've never watched her videos. Like, I don't know. She might be the devil incarnate, whatever. But my impression is that she's a human and maybe we should just, but that doesn't make, like, rape apologies, apologetics okay either. Like, it's just, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I think, I think it's completely possible to, like, condemn someone's behavior, but then not, like, tear into them mercilessly. I do think Mm. that within everyone there's at least like a sliver of empathy we can give them Mm. like but yes I do get comments actually I laughed when you asked because my last video received a comment just like that where (laughs) someone was like wow I'm unsubscribing you have a lot of lukewarm takes (laughs) and it's just kind of like I mean yeah like I do have videos (laughs) where the takes are not spicy but like it would be so boring if all of my videos were just hot takes. So, mm. yeah, some people do not like how in the middle I kind of try to be. And that's completely understandable, especially because I think commentary is very like, the, these are the facts, these are my opinions. So I, I'm, I'm aware that like my style is not as universally accepted, mm. but... I do think it's important to approach those topics and people, right? Like real people with like human decency. But you're also right that it depends on the case. Well, exactly. And that's why I think if you're talking about issues, so for example, if you're talking about like sexism, you can be as scathing and as like sweary and as oh, yeah. <laughs> loud and aggressive as you want to be because you're not talking about a specific person. Or even if it is about a person who's like just so beyond. I mean, I don't know if I believe anyone's beyond redemption, but like, you know, someone really terrible, right? Like, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I I don't need to name an example, but like, versus talking about like a YouTuber who, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm sure there are some really terrible YouTubers, but in general, like, they are just people who have effed up in the context of online, right? They've not, not, you know, R-word someone, they've not, you know, 
been super duper rich. Well, whatever, you know what I'm saying. Like I, think... I do, yes. Just want to add that, obviously, I am aware that there have been YouTubers that have R-worded people and have been super duper racist on the platform. I think I just sort of misspoke there. I think what I was trying to refer to were the everyday things YouTubers are critiqued for. So, so not really, really terrible things, but sort of like everyday screw-ups. You know, stuff like where they misspeak in a video, or they are rude to a fan, or are rude to another creator. You know what I mean? I'm talking about like more petty internet drama. That's kind of like the everyday stuff that YouTubers get critiqued for. I'm not referring to like really serious things which are criminal or horribly unethical. So yeah, just wanted to clarify that. Enjoy! Yeah, um, and I do find that is a really hard balance to have. Mm -hmm. Um, And also it's this kind of culture on YouTube, especially especially commentary YouTube, is that you've kind of always got to be the jokester and always got to have the hottest take and always got to be like the funniest thumbnail and i do think sometimes it's like do you actually think this person's this bad or is it just for entertainment kind of right like how much how much of a character are you playing when you address like these things that's something i've had like someone ask me like after one of my videos i I received a comment that was like how much of that was real or how much of that was like part of the script and i didn't have an answer for them because it's like ooh. Like, I I do put, like, a lot of my opinions into the script, but you do have to, like, throw in a few jokes just to, like, Mm. spice up the video. And then some people are like, like, where did those jokes come from? Is that really how you feel? And it's, I, I find it interesting because obviously, like, a YouTuber is not a direct one to one comparison with, like, who they are on camera and who they are in real life. And, Right, finding out where that divide happens is so interesting to me. Right? Mm. Like like how much of you are you portraying on camera is a question I ask myself all the time. Yeah. Do you do you know the answer to it or are you still working? I'm still that trying out? to figure that out. I try to be as authentic as I can on camera because I do think that is the selling point for commentary. Because I think mm. people are subscribing for the people and for their opinions. And I want to be like, as myself as I can be, so people subscribe for like who I am. But I, again, topic to topic, right? If you address Mm. a certain topic, you kind of have to conduct yourself in a certain way that doesn't like come across as inauthentic. At this point, I don't know what I'm saying, but I try to be as realistic as I can be. Yeah. Yeah. I have a potentially hot take, and I would like to hear your thoughts. I wonder if authenticity on YouTube is a little bit overrated. And what Mm. I'm saying is, I'm not saying lie to your audience. No, no, no. But what I am saying is that, for example... I do think there are sort of things you need to omit about yourself for privacy reasons. Of course, right. Yeah, and like, or for example, say if you're someone who, I don't know, you've got like health issues, like, and and this is as coming from someone who has like a a mental health issue. I don't want to share that side of me, you know what I mean? Because this is like my job now. And like, obviously... Uh, you know it's good to talk about things but sometimes you like want to keep this space for you and for your creativity and you don't want to like cloud it with like your baggage and shit you know what I mean absolutely I do yeah yeah I think I think when it comes to like building the the character you play to use that phrase it's more using the the parts of you that are relevant to the video in the sense that, like, mm. you don't want to be 100% yourself in a video. Because if I'm talking about some TikTok trend and I'm dumping all of this personal information about myself that's not relevant, it's going to take away from the topic at hand. So mm. for me, I, I do think it is very important to not put everything out there because, like, YouTube is like a website and I'm not interested in, like, pushing my entire personality onto some website 
like at the end of the day, like that, a lot of that stuff is internal. It's private. It's something I share with like personal friends and maybe not a public video platform where anyone can find it, you know? So I, I think when it comes to the production of YouTube, then you want to be as much of yourself as the video calls for. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, because I think when you do reveal things about yourself, you're kind of like um, showing trust in your audience. And I think as an audience member, that can be like really like rewarding. Um, but I agree, it is only I think it's only rewarding when it's relevant to the video. If it feels like offloading, um, that can be a little bit sort of jarring and a bit like, whoa, I, I didn't sign right. up for this, um, you know. Um, whereas if it's directly related to the video, it, it I think especially if it's say if you say hey I'm talking about this thing because it directly affects me I think that gives like a sense of trust and authenticity <laughs> to go back to right. that. So yeah, yeah it's 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 a I think it's a tricky one like um and I think it's also hard to know yourself if you're being authentic because you don't watch yourself your friends and family watch you exactly. like I don't really know what I look like when I'm talking because I don't talk in the mirror like I mean right, yeah who, who knows maybe I'm complete I do think like it's a more performative and jazzy version of myself mm -hmm. um yeah for sure but it still feels like me you know I don't know yeah so. absolutely right like it's all very controlled right like because I don't know if you edit your own stuff but I, I edit my I own stuff and so I choose what people see right yeah. like it is very deliberate what is shown on camera and i'm constantly reminded of that because it's not like a mental thing it's not like i can't have people see this when i like edit my videos but like i love it when my friends will take candid pictures of me and then i'll be like is that what i look like yeah like, is that yeah, what i look yeah. like when i'm bending over or like lifting my <laughs> what and so whenever i do <laughs> whenever that happens it's like hmm People are just seeing different versions and perspectives of you all the time. And when it comes to YouTube, it's very specific and very deliberate. So I try to remember that when I'm watching like vlogs or lifestyle content or like any type of video style that is supposed to be like the author's true self, you can't just be like, not really, because it's edited, it's stylized, and I don't know. It's just something that it's hard to think about all the time. But like when it comes to YouTube, I think it's important. Mm. So in light of and also this kind of reminds me since like you had a recent growth, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on. So you know how YouTube culture has changed. I'm sure you're aware of this, like how uh, in 2016 it was all like anti-woke, uh, fucking yeah. anti-feminist shit. Do you think your channel could have existed back then do you think your channel could have existed uh in the days of shane dawson and whatever the fuck he was doing um oh, that is a good question i if it it would have been niche it would have been absolutely like a very small community of people i think some of your videos wouldn't have which we can talk about yes, in a minute. Ab no, and I mean that as a compliment. Right about that. I mean that as a big fat compliment, by the way. <laughs> well, I mean, you're right. Like, I do try to conduct myself in a very, like, understanding perspective. And, like, YouTube was not understanding in 2016 at all. <laughs> like, I'm very thankful that YouTube culture has changed. Mm. I'm not entirely sure how that happened. But, like, now that everyone is being more, like, accepting, accepting and welcoming, I do think it's more possible for, like, channels like mine to exist. You know what video of yours that I think, um, and I mean this as a compliment, you would have been called yeah. a cuck and, like, a whatever for. Um, I love that video of yours. It's about uh, an actor named Malena something, and it's, like, uh, the internet owes oh, actor's right. name and apology. I've forgotten her name. Yeah, Basically, it's for Milana context. Milana Vintrub, I think. There we go. Do you want to tell the folks about that video? Because I just think, A, they should watch it, and B, it's like a really important <laughs> lesson on the internet. Just tell us the story if you, you. If you fancy. Um, yeah, it's there is an actress named Milana Vintrub. I first saw her 
in like YouTube sketch comedy, like back in 2013 or 14. Like she's been around for a while, mm. but she is most well known for the American AT and T commercials where she plays like Lily. I believe the character's name is, and the Lily from AT and T commercials. Like that's what they ended up being called because she became kind of a, a household name just because she was like cute and like. Like, it was a joke that, like, oh, you have a crush from on Lily from AT&T, like, the schoolyard. And people like, no, I don't. Like, everyone would, like, have this kind of, like, secret crush harboring for this spokesmodel, for this phone company. <laughs> and unfortunately, right, as, like, those people grew up, like, the way they approached crushes and, like, celebrities in general, it become it became very toxic and targeted especially on her body like she would not be able to post a picture of herself without comments like talking about her body or like being very invasive and targeted and for some reason that became a meme for some mm. god awful reason like i wish i knew but like i don't know why mm. it became like this collective thing like just one month suddenly to talk about her using terms for like how her figure was it was terrible and it, it reached the point where like <clears throat> she finally addressed it and in in the instagram live that she was addressing it on just the comments are all the targeted complaints like you see one or two people being like this is terrible i'm so sorry this is happening but then it immediately gets drowned out and it, it's just just a very interesting look at how celebrities, specifically celebrity women, are not treated as people, as like real humans. They're, they're admired, but then that admiration turns into this kind of like perverted fantasy where you can just say mm. things. And mm. it's not real because she's a celebrity. And so my video is just talking about that story and thankfully it ends on kind of a, a good note because she's back at the AT&T commercials but she mm. is in control of like how she is presented and so she's like often behind desks or like hidden by something so she's able to like do her job just in a, a place where she's more comfortable but that whole story is I don't know like I, I wanted to talk about that as soon as I started my channel, but I had no idea how to do it. And so eventually I hit that moment where it's like, I got to talk about this. And basically the thesis of my video was like, don't do this. It was not a very intellectual video in the sense of like broad terms. It's just like, don't, if you are the person to do this, don't. Well, I mean, it's a, you, you say like, that's not the most like intellectual, whatever. I, I mean, I, I cannot, uh, overstate its importance I think it's a really important lesson because perhaps we all contribute to jokes of objectifying women or not we all like but you know what I mean like so for I example do, right. if you're someone who says like oh she's hot or whatever you need to be careful about if you're saying it in a way that's stoking the fire for people to objectify her and it got to the point of harassment and it was just it was hard like it was a hard video to watch but I'm so glad you made it like it was amazing and it's like god it's just and this reminds me a little bit actually like we've both made videos on classically Abbey and I yeah mm -hmm. one of the things I find disturbing is that there are you know I can't remember the name of the meme but like it's like a, a small fraction like a tiny minority of leftist men who will like make really derogatory comments about her body like say like i hate her as a person but she's got great x you know what i mean you know what i'm talking I about i unfortunately right? know exactly what you mean yeah and it's just like if the whole so like i criticize her because i don't like her argument that a woman's worth is uh for her from her body and from how she presents herself like what she wears mm -hmm. so if that's our problem with her you know <laughs> to then like have the same side or like the same like side of the aisle have people literally objectifying her and talking yeah. about her body it's like literally just 
undoing the point and it's just not acceptable you know like she's yeah, not absolutely. consenting to that it's and, it's so easy yeah. to like criticize what she says without like leaning into that like i don't understand the people who are like I hate exactly. her, but like, oh, she looks amazing. It's like, yeah. you, can, you can just not say the second half of that sentence. Yeah, exactly. 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 No, that's, um, yeah. Well, actually, that <laughs> reminds me. Um, my next sort of question is, um, you know, you have talked about like some gender stuff on your channel. That's not like the main thing, but um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to kind of point out that I think the way you talk about like sexism is like really well done. And actually the first video I came across was about um, a young creator, very young, like couldn't have been older than 18, who talked about how he like loves lesbians and relates to lesbians. Yeah. Yes. Uh, for context, um, a, a really young creator, like a video game creator, is that what he does? Yeah, he's one of like those 18. Minecraft streamers. Yeah. Right, right, right. And he's huge. He's like, uh, and he um, basically made a stream being like, "I get lesbians." Like, uh, I totally. <laughs> and I think people responded like, "Yo, um, being a guy attracted to women is not the same as a woman attracted to women because women who are attracted to women get oppressed for it." Um, right. But I thought the way you talked about that was so good because it's like, yeah, he it's not it's not the best optics. Like, my guy, it's a bit of a silly thing to say. But like, mm -hmm. A, he's really young, and B, I really don't think he actually meant harm. And like, I don't know, I just think it was really interesting to hear your perspective on that. Um Thank yeah. you. Do you want yeah. to tell us about your thoughts on that whole topic? Like yeah, that, when guys say certain things. <laughs> that's another one that's just like <laughs> tricky. Because again, I don't think I think his name's Tommy in it. That's not he's not the devil yeah. for saying I get no. lesbians. But it's just a very no. like uneducated take to have. Because like <laughs> yeah. you you can empathize with it, but you can't <laughs> understand it. And uh the 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 video is not so much me like making a hard line stance on it, mm. but it's covering the the division that it caused in that fan base. Um, because oh, like you know every yeah. a Minecraft streamer will sneeze and it'll get trending on Twitter. So like the conversation <laughs> around that was like exploding online about like mm. can this eighteen year old say that he gets lesbians? <laughs> I I tried my best to talk about like how the media kind of like essentially like the the male-centric media like a lot of movies and tv how they approach lesbians and how they kind of like make mm. it for men so i think like this kid he's not saying he gets lesbians out of nowhere but like that's kind of how the conversation leads right it's like oh men can get lesbians because the content about lesbians has been shaped for men and mm. thankfully a lot of the comments were receptive but i did get people who were like you're a man you can't talk about this right like like you can't talk about another man getting lesbians when you're a man and mm. for those comments i i don't really have an answer because they're kind of right it's not really like <clears throat> it's not my place to like stick my flag and be like lesbians are people because like you can say that but you can't make yourself the figurehead of that when yeah. you're a man so i that was another video all of these videos go back to the question you had about what was the hardest because that was another one that i was like i want to talk about this but i want to do it right and i tried my best i think i did all right but that whole no, I topic is did. tricky it is i think i don't know i think you talk about gender in a very considered way i i i personally i mean i can't speak for all women i can't speak for all queer women but like i personally want men to speak out and to have those conversations because the fact of the matter is is that men usually watch men and you know i just think it's really important to keep these conversations going it shouldn't just be women having them right um right you know and there's you know there's good ways of doing it and there's bad ways of doing it some men do it in like a really condescending way and and i'm sure it's it's the same with like race and stuff like you've got to just be so careful like i do get asked sometimes to make videos where i just think 
I don't think this is my place. I I will right, be yeah. an ally and I will share stuff like petitions and stuff, but really don't think this is my place. Like, do you get Absolutely. asked stuff like that? I do. I do check like my my Instagram DMs, mm. and it's always like some people are like, "Hey, can you talk about this?" or like, "I want to hear your thoughts on this." And whenever it's a topic that, again, I feel like more established creators, more educated creators have talked about it. I'm, I kind of try to tell them like, Hey, like as much as I want to like talk about this, it's not really my place, but I will tell them like in the the comment that they send me, like I will give my take, but I'll make a note of like, like other creators have talked about this. Here are some links, but Mm. like, it's not exactly like my area of forte. Like it's not exactly something I want to like, wear that specific hat on right exactly have you ever had it where you've wanted to make a video on something but then you saw a bigger creator do it so you're like shit can i do this oh all the time (laughs) there are so many commentary channels on youtube i'll that's gotten to the point where like whenever i pick a topic i have to like set aside five minutes to like just look up be like has anyone talked about this before (laughs) yeah and then it's tricky because then you'll watch that video and you're like all right people have talked about this but you still want to talk about it, but you don't want to copy them. So it, it's, it's tricky because it's a very it's a very busy website. There's millions of people on here all, all seconds of the day. Have I you guess ever it depends how specific. That? Yes, I had that recently. Um, oh, really? And I think in my case, it was too specific. I wanted to make a video on the whole concept, concept of envy. Fucking ContraPoints releases like three <laughs> videos a year. She's an absolute queen. She releases like full feature films. I can't put a video <laughs> out about Envy. <laughs> yeah, like I can't do it now. <laughs> like if it was something a bit more general, you know. Right. Or, but like, I don't know. I just, I really, I feel like it wouldn't look good. And I'm like, you yeah, know what? I'll just park that. It's one of those I'll very unfortunate it. situations yeah. where it's just like, but, there's you know, no getting around it. Exactly. But she did an amazing job and, you know, she's wonderful. So mm-hmm. it's it was, it was great. That, you know what I mean? It would have pissed me off if it was like a creator that I thought was shit. But, if, but it's someone I look up to and take inspiration from. So I'm okay right. with that. She did a much better job than I probably ever would have anyway so but it was just that moment when I got the notification I was like ContraPoint's got a new video and then I was like Envy? <laughs> right. yeah. You see the title I'm like oh. I was like yeah. just gonna have Envy and then like me wearing green in the thumbnail with like green oh. light and I was like fuck <laughs> <Yeah>. ah. <laughs> oh well but Actually, that reminds me. Um, who do you take inspiration from? Who were your inspirations going in uh, when you started? Or now? That's a good question. I mean, this is awkward. It's you for one. I, I one of my no. It's already documented in my Q and A video. I have people being like, "Who are your top three inspirations?" And like, I I listed you, and then a week later, then we started talking about this, and it was Yay! like, "Oh no," but um. I think it is you, and then as far as commentary goes, my top inspirations are Jarvis Johnson and Eddie Burback. I I really like the way that Jarvis approaches the topics he talks about, and then I like Eddie's style of like blending Mm. like the comedy with the topic, and Mm. so. Like like I said, for years I've been watching commentary YouTube and just absorbing this content. And so when I'm here trying to like do it for myself, it's kind of like, I would like to emulate kind of like these creators that inspire me. Yeah. And like, I feel absolutely. Like both jo- oh, sorry, yeah. go on. Oh, no, no. So I was just going to say both Jarvis and Eddie are example examples of YouTubers who are like really funny, but also just like really humane in their commentary. Right. Yeah. I've never watched their stuff and felt like they've stooped really low to make a joke. Like it's always felt like everything's really like just and yeah, I really appreciate that about them. Mm-hmm. So, well, again, not to not to be a sap, but like you also inspire me in that form as well because your videos like talk about like real issues and like very like interesting conversations that I think need to happen. But like the way you do it is just so very 
like down to earth, very like objective and it's just fun to watch. So like I I watch your stuff and it's like, I wanna be like this. Ah, stop, I'm blushing. <laughs> I, that's I won't talk about that anymore, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's lovely. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I actually didn't realise you watched my work until because I was watching you for like a few months and then I just found like one of your comments on one of my old videos and I was like, Oh, you're a subscription. <laughs> It's like, yeah. yes, <laughs> gotta come on the pod. Absolutely, and here, yeah. you are. and here you are. So what do you think the future of your channel is? I know it's still a baby, it's still very young. I mean, have you even been on YouTube a year yet? I I made the channel in December of 2019, and then I started mm. making commentary in quarantine. So yeah, I, I think it's been... March. At least a full year. I'm terrible with math. It's been like a Don't year worry. and a half. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, as far as the future goes, like I said, it's like my goal is to get that subscription plaque, the 100K thing. Mm. And then I have no idea what's coming next. Like, I, yeah. I would like to keep doing this as long as I can. But yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. It's like my headlights only go so far. I can't really yeah. see what's out there but I'm having fun with it well it's good I mean just take it day by day and just enjoy exactly right so I just want to grab a few more of the cues that the subscription sent me because there's actually a bit of crossover between wait what are your what have your subscribers called what do you call them that is an have ongoing debate um oh you gotta get a name for them yeah I gotta gotta optimize and give them a brand association um people have called like the dast nerds the kunkin council some people call themselves donuts because <laughs> it's like duncan donuts so okay there's just a bunch of like competing names i just kind of like let them all be accepted but yes oh. no those are good, those are all good ones i feel like any of those would work um mm -hmm. so someone has asked what are your thoughts um and they're by mine because i i'm also here Hi. Um, <laughs> about like the effect of social media on our generation. So this is going to be us revealing our ages. Would you describe yourself as Gen, 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 Gen Z uh, or millennial or what would your... I, I think I'm born in that gray area of like 1997 to 99 where it's like You're nobody knows. I'm a cusper, right. I, mm. think, I think I do officially fall into Gen Z, mm. but... I, I'm like the older Gen Z. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Social media. I mean, I want to hear your thoughts on that first. Well, I would say I'm like the youngest millennial, um, mm -hmm. you know, 95. Um, so, yeah, I what I will say is I'm bloody glad I did not have TikTok, Instagram, whatever, when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. I just, I am really concerned. Um and I don't mean that in like a jokey way. I'm genuinely concerned about how it's going to affect the future. Like, I think it's awesome. Like, I, I really like seeing that young people are talking about politics and stuff. I think that's fabulous. I'm just worried about their mental health. I'm worried about the fact that like, yeah. you can be canceled at 13. <laughs> if cancel culture even exists, that's a whole different debate. But like, assuming- But what a concept, young... right? Being right, called yeah. out by like your classmates. Like- Yeah. Yeah, it just feels like, I mean, cyberbullying was a thing at my age. It was on fucking AOL Messenger, but like it was a thing. Imagine if it right, was on yeah. TikTok, you know, where there's an algorithm encouraging oh, it. Yeah. I'm I'm fearful. I'm really worried. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just very grateful I didn't have all that. Did you, you know, you're only like two years younger than me, so I guess you probably didn't have it that much either. I <clears throat> I remember getting like an Instagram in eighth grade. And like only having like a hundred followers and like people being like, he only has 100 followers. <laughs> and I was like, what is this? What is happening? <laughs> so like I, I was kind of entering my, my teen years around the time social media was really like becoming commonplace in like my schools. And I really just flew under the radar when it came to that. Like I barely posted. I kept like my circle small. I didn't have a Twitter until like three years ago. So mm. I kind of avoided. Oh God, Twitter scares me. Mm. Yeah, even I as know. an adult, we'll get into that. <laughs> um, but like you, you mentioning TikTok, that 
I, I mean, TikTok really rose to fame when I was 19 and like, kind of like, egg, like on my exit of through college. Mm-hmm. But like, I can't imagine being in fifth grade and like making TikToks and like having those like circle back and like having people like judge you on like the content you make. That whole cycle, I really don't know what that's going to do to like fourth graders, fifth graders, anyone like below the age of 11, like having this constant media source. I mean, not to like, like catastrophize, but like, what would that do to a person? Like, especially in their developing years. I'm nervous. No, I agree. <laughs> no me too. I, I really am. Like, I think even uh, as an adult, you know, as someone with a platform, um, I, it's a lot of pressure. And there are times where I'm like, holy shit, can I do this? Mm-hmm. God, so glad I didn't have this when I was even like, 21 for example like yeah it's just you you i mean that's the whole thing your brain isn't fully developed till you're 25 and you just aren't emotionally ready for the pressure you know it's just absolutely yeah i feel for kids i really do mm-hmm. yeah um but i also don't have tiktok i literally only find TikTok. that's the way to go yeah, yeah it it's a scary place uh, but then twitter's also terrifying so i don't tweet i just observe uh mm-hmm. because it's a good place to sort of find content and stuff but it's terrifying yeah i it's it's the only way to really like use it and embrace it is to like ignore like all the detriments and like the red flags which is not healthy but like that's that's how i log on to twitter every day without losing my mind yeah, I enjoy your tweets actually. You got you yours are funny. They're not too serious, are they? Yeah, they're very dumb. I I would agree. I think Twitter, like when people and there's nothing wrong with it, like it can be very educational, but I couldn't be the kind of person that uses Twitter as like a political platform because it, yeah. it just looks terrifying and a lot of pressure. So. Absolutely. I admire the people who can do that without mm. losing it. But like, yeah. I, I could never. Couldn't be me. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. So this is a really random question, but I want to bring it up because it's just very funny. And you know this because I told you this when we had a little break. Someone sent in asking us to share our opinions on zoos, like whether they're <laughs> ethical. Um, if you don't mind me asking, like, do you, are you like veggie at all or anything? No judgment if not. Uh, my, my whole house here has like some kind of dietary thing. I have celiac disease and my dad is a vegan. Ah. So like our whole like diet and like what we eat has, has to adapt to like both of those. So I have been eating a lot of like bunless plant-based burgers. (laughs) Um, well, I don't even know if they are burgers at that point, but like, (laughs) Yeah. yeah, like I, I try to avoid eating meat as often as I can just mm. because I, I am aware of like all of the horrible stuff that goes into that zoos however yeah that that's why I asked because I was just wondering if it's like connected right like I, I feel like I as a appreciate... vegan I should have but yeah I don't know <laughs> sorry go on I mean I have a similar debate internally like with museums right because they are mm. They're educational, and, like, I can see, like, how young people in a museum, like, are there to learn, new experience, like, expand and broaden their perspectives on the world. But you can also look at them through the lens of, like, it's a trophy case of, like, things that it's taken from other, like, places, other civilizations. They just kind of, like, swooped in, nabbed them, and ran off. Like... Mm. Like, when we, I, I want to appreciate the educational values of museums and zoos, but also it's like, I don't know, you kind of just went to a different geographical area and grabbed things <laughs> and just put them here. And especially, it's different with animals because those are like conscious beings. Like, I don't, I don't know the effects of like what a penguin goes through when it like roams a tiny little thing. 24 7 mm. like exactly it's sad like it makes me sad but like when i'm at the zoo 
like half of my brain is like, ooh, look, penguins. And then the other <laughs> half has to be like, mm, I don't know if this is good. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good answer. I mean, it, even I, even as someone who's like a vegan, I, I don't really know if I have a definitive answer. I don't like zoos. In an mm -hmm. ideal world, I think we wouldn't have them, but I understand that they have a role in conservation. And right. I do think, like, for example, um, fortunately, I didn't have this at my school, but I don't know if at your school you ever dissected frogs or anything Thankfully, like that. Thankfully, we, we did not have oh, that. Oh, good. But, oh. Well, that's a big thing. Um, it's still, like, even in the UK at other schools. And, like, the thing I think about that is that people make the argument it's for education. But I'm like, listen, if you give a bunch of teenagers a dead frog to cut open, what are they going to learn from that? They're just going to piss around. And yeah, I do think it's yeah. a similar thing with zoos. It's like when I get with young children, it's a bit different. But with like older children, when they go to a zoo, they're not like, hmm, this is what it's like to be a tiger in their natural habitat. Like, I don't feel like they're really learning that much. They're just seeing animals and probably messing around. Whereas right. like, for example, David Attenborough documentaries, like you've mm -hmm. learned so much from them. Yes, you're not in the place, but like you get to see them where they're meant to be and how they actually are meant to live and it's just so much more magical you know yeah, um absolutely so i i i would say i am against zoos that being said i'm not like let's ban them all straight away because i understand that some of them have a role in conservation and yeah. i appreciate that it's not as straightforward as just get rid of all zoos you know it's um, exactly yeah yeah but yeah, that was a random question, but I love that that person It's making me think. That. I'm going to think about that for the rest of the week. Like, <laughs> the next time I go to a zoo, I'm going to be like, ooh. I'm going to think back to this yeah. question. Yeah, zoos are probably open now, actually. I mean, oh, God, that reminds me of um Tiger King. It's like, um, did you watch Tiger ooh. King? Yeah, I did. That was a, that was a time. Like... I think this is another thing, actually. I spoke to someone the other day who uh, had a friend who had a, um, oh, what are those big cats called? They had a massive cat. It was like, um, oh, this is going to annoy me. Basically, they had a pet cat that was like a mixture between a domesticated cat and like a mini leopard. Oh. And the cat went over the neighbor's fence and ate all their rabbits. And yeah. I and that led to me saying I don't think people should be able to have like semi wild animals as pets. You know, it right. just doesn't see, especially like in London. They had it in London. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you terrifying. Have an, if you have an animal that's like primary instinct is to go hunt and like kill things, then like maybe having it in a city <laughs> and other people's pets nearby. Exactly. That's, oh man, yeah. that's true. What was it? It was, I, this is going to annoy me if I don't find out, so I'm going to try and I know find people out. have, like, ocelots as pets, or, like, some kind of, like, ocelot breed. Bengal. It's a Bengal cat. Bengals, that's right. I don't know os ocelots. Um, Bengals, like, they're beautiful, but they're massive. I mean, they're, they, they could easily eat my dog. Right. Yeah, anything that's, like, and I would... could, like, reach my knees is, like, mm, it's too big. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. No, no, no. Yeah, so... I, I would say, yeah, I'd come down quite hard on that and be like, no, let's just not have those as pets, please. So then what did you um, think of Tiger King, right? Like, I, like people who own, like, 100, 200 tigers, like... Yeah, I think that's very fucked up. And also, <laughs> it's interesting because, again, like, the lady, I always forget her name, used the whole conservation argument. Um, right. When actually, you know, there were tigers dying in her care and stuff. And I, I just think... I do think like sometimes the conservation argument can be used as a bit of a cop out when it's like, is, is yeah. it really for them or is it for you? Right. Like I, when you hit 200 tigers, it's no longer about the tigers. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Yeah, that was a, I feel like that documentary broke the internet. Well, yeah, that was at the very beginning of quarantine, right? It so, like, was, that was the time yes. when everyone's like, what's that? There's a crazy man with, like, 300 tigers in Florida? I'll watch yeah. it. Like, that, 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 really that had a grip one. on everyone. Yeah. It did. You no, know, it was good, though. It was, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely don't want people having tigers as pets. Um, I don't want my dog to be eaten by next-door neighbor's 
fucking baby tiger uh, exactly no thank you um <laughs> that would be yeah no um i mean i did see a video recently someone had like a pig on a leash and someone went up to them and had a go mm. at them and they were like hey the pig's not bothering yeah. anyone <laughs> like don't yell at the pig <laughs> <laughs> exactly she was like it was so funny i'll find i'll try and find it and i'll send it to you um it, she was like why do you have a pig and the lady was like it's an emotional support pig and she was like it's fucking huge <laughs> yeah i want to know why you have a he's not hurting you look at him he's fine he's, on the he's on a leash dog. we're I'm cleaning sure. up after him we're Oh, no. she's like it's big but it's still emotional support <laughs> it was oh, my man. favorite it was just so absurd i was like is this real or is this a sketch but like there was a pig on a leash that's so. the kind of thing where like if i saw that on the street i'd be like huh but like it's not something worth like fighting no, anybody you about. wouldn't call yeah. the cops <laughs> exactly right uh. Oh, well, I think, you know, we've answered all the cues and we talked about some great stuff. Um, thank you for being here. Absolutely. It's been an absolute thank you. delight. Do you want to tell all the people where they can find you? You can find me on youtube.com. That's this mm -hmm. website slash Kunkin Dastner. Nice. With a K. Right. K-U-N-C-A-N-D-A-S-T-N-E-R, <laughs> whatever. Do you have other things? You have Twitter, you have the gram, right? Yeah, I have a Twitter and an Instagram all linked in the channel. It's you, You'll find me there. I'll link them. I'll link them. Aww. Yeah. Well, wow, this has been delightful. So shall we do, um, you know, the bye-bye now? The oh, thing yes. I, from Toy Story. Okay, mm -hmm. shall we do it? And we could do it to all our right. cameras, actually. So, all right. yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now. Thank now. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>